Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined today in studio by President Wyatt. Scott, good to see you again. Well, it's good to see you, Steve. Beautiful fall day. It is a beautiful fall day, and uh, um, we always love to have uh, people on the show to talk about new and innovative projects, and the one we're going to talk about today is near and dear to our hearts. This one is, uh, this is part of our ongoing um, uh, year effort to look back at some of the innovative things that we've tried to be involved in and to really uh, go back and hold ourselves accountable for what has been successful and what has been maybe less successful than we'd hoped. And in every case, to look at the the highs and the lows and to, uh, to really help ourselves understand that uh, innovation, while wonderful, is disruptive. And uh, and so we've wanted to go back and and see just how how successful and or how disruptive they've been. And uh, as I mentioned, this this particular uh, program we're going to talk about today, and these two people that have joined us are are near and dear to my heart. So why don't you introduce our guests? Yeah, thank you, Steve. So we're really happy to have with us today Tess Douglas, um, who is the director of dual enrollment and placement services at Southwest Tech and also Vice President of Instruction, Will Pierce. Thanks, Will and Tess, for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Um, you are the sausage makers. <laughs> <laughs> so so when, this, when this whole project started, Steve, uh, and, and I should introduce you, Steve, too, <laughs> right? Well, that's right. I, I mean, you were I the— spearheaded it on our side. Yep. <laughs> on the Southern Utah University side. But when we first started this, Tess, you were working at Southern Utah University. I was, yep. 17 years. 17 years. Yep. And then switched over, which has been a great benefit to us because you you know both schools so well. I think for our listeners, it might be helpful to say one thing at the beginning, and that is um, Southwest Tech and Southern Utah University, both in a reasonably small community, less than a mile apart from each other. Yeah. So if as long as I've got... Um, you know, maybe 15 minutes, then I can walk if I have a, if I need to walk over there. That That's actually, you know, we, we recently had a meeting with someone else um, because when things are successful, people will try to replicate it. And it, it's, uh, it really is that sincerest form of flattery. Um, but, but Will and I had to say in that meeting, one of the reasons that this works so well is because we are in a small community and we are very close together and we have to see each other at Walmart, we have to see each other at church, we have to see each other at ball games, and nobody wants to be the jerk that cheesed the whole deal, right? Um, <laughs> so so it, it, it yeah, it there's there is actually something to be said about the geography of this whole thing and the the uh, the the closeness and the close knit uh, aspect of our community just generally really had a positive impact and we'll talk a little bit more about that but but yeah. it, we shouldn't discount the fact that this might actually be hard for people in larger metropolitan areas to do because it, it's you're not nearly as close to one another as we are here that's right well why don't you give us just a, a little summary of your life story <laughs> how did you you're you're the vice president of instruction at yeah. southwest technical college yeah. um that wasn't your first job no, no. So, um, so I grew up in Boston or surrounding areas, Massachusetts, a long, long ways away from here. And, um, and uh, I joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. And I was in the Marines for eight years active duty. You're from uh, Boston. That explains the red hair. 
It probably explains a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, um, so the Marine Corps brought me to California. I, I, I was there for a long time and and uh, different places, but I always came back to California. And uh, after after my time in the military, I, I moved to Mesquite, Nevada. And I was in Mesquite for about 12 years, and I worked as a uh, journeyman and a master electrician, an electrical contractor. And then uh, uh, in that time, I, I got a, a undergraduate degree at UNLV in workforce education. And uh, <laughs> I don't know that they have that program anymore, yeah. but I wish they did. And, um, and I got a job at Salt Lake Community College um, as a uh, director of apprenticeship programs. And in, in that department at that time, we had about 32 or three programs, and we had about 1,800 students. So it was a pretty decent-sized program. And uh, I did that for about five years and really fell in love with the technical education piece of it. And so I moved to Davis Technical College in, uh, in Kaysville, and I was there about seven years as a director of programs and then was promoted to vice president of quality and development and uh, had a strange, weird grouping of, of things, including student services and marketing and uh, data, uh, institutional research areas, and, uh, and have always wanted to be in Cedar City. Uh, my family kind of wanted to be in Cedar City. I had two two children who had committed to SUU, and a position <laughs> came open at SUU, <laughs> and so or at uh, at Southwest Tech, and so I uh, made application and and convinced President Wood to to hire me. So, <laughs> so I ended up here. So I hope that's brief enough. And so <laughs> yeah, that's good. And I and uh, I don't. Your life know. has been almost as like weird like mine. Yeah, <laughs> that's you, right. you really. You really bounced around. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, and well, I'm not even sure your hair's red. It just uh, popped out. It used to be red. It, it, <laughs> when I was a kid, my hair color was about as red as as SUU's uh, banner. So, <laughs> uh, Steve and I have the same color hair. It's called Arctic Blonde. <laughs> is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, Arctic right. Blonde. Yeah. Was... When I buy my hair coloring at this at this at the salon, <laughs> it's, it's right. Arctic Blonde. Yeah. <laughs> President, I, w- I would be really uh, pleased to watch you get your hair colored. And I think we could actually sell tickets to that if, in fact, that actually occurred, which uh, well, I the, think it doesn't. The older I get, you know, I have to color my hair to match my age. So. Is that what it is? Yeah. My, uh, I, in, rather than Arctic Blonde, I, I have always imagined mine to be salt and pepper, but now almost entirely salt. Very, yeah. very little pepper remaining in the, in the mix here. Between the two, I'm a real fan of pepper, so I'll just go with Artie Blonde. <laughs> Tess, yes, give us uh, give us your story. Okay, it's not quite as exciting and varied as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved here from the tiny town of Panaca, Nevada, about 800 people, in 2000 to attend SUU as a student. And my second semester here, I got a student job on campus in continuing education. And I really, really enjoyed it. And while I was working in continuing ed, SUU decided to start its study abroad program. And student workers or students were bringing in applications to be the very first student worker in that office. And I was accepting these applications because I was at the front desk and I kept thinking, gosh, what a cool job that would be. That would be so neat. I want that job. And then I thought, duh, just go talk to the, the woman in charge. At the time, it was, it was a Russian woman. I don't know if you knew her. It was Ola Pryotnikova. No, that was yeah. before me. Yeah, she she started it, but and her husband was a dean here. And so I just went to her office and said, hey, could I be your student worker? And she said, yeah, that'd be great, because we already knew each other. And so she talked to my boss at the time, and my boss was like, yeah, that'd be fine. And that's kind of how I got started. So I was the very first student worker in the study abroad program right when it began. And so... And I just, I loved it so much once I started doing that job and and helping to build that program. It was just, it was so much fun. And I was meeting people from all over the world and I was helping students go to other countries and I studied abroad. And so at that point, I I decided this will be my career. And and it was because I left SUU 
what it was just two years ago so I guess 2018 and and for that whole time I worked in study abroad and just loved it loved it loved it and the only reason I left was because I I just started getting a little bit I think unchallenged by it you know I'd been doing it for so long but it was it was really fun to see that program grow from zero students you know in the first year as we were developing it into 500 students the year I left you know and one of the reasons I went over to um, Southwest Tech when I saw this job opening was I thought, gosh, that would be really cool because it's building a program again from scratch a little bit. And I know a lot about working with different institutions because I'd been working with international universities who vary widely depending on the country and how they structure things. And I'd worked a lot with course articulations for students who were doing semesters abroad. And so I thought, okay, I could bring that and it just seemed like a really, really neat challenge and a really good learning opportunity to try something new in a different, you know, system of, of higher ed right within my state. And so I was really fortunate to get hired, and now I've been there two years. That's great. And and uh, f- for our audience that hasn't uh, met you and can't see, there is no Arctic blonde. Not quite yet. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, let's let's frame this just a little bit, and the framing is is that um, Southern Utah University is a regional university that grants credit and awards degrees from certificates, associates, all the way up to masters, and it looks like we'll have our first doctorate um, in a year. I'm knocking on wood over here. Yeah. Yeah. Southwest Tech, uh, and, and we've been around for almost 125 years. Southwest Tech is um, a spectacular um, technical college granting certificates, um, career-based certificates, plus uh, retraining in a variety of ways and formats, um, and has been around how long? We started in 1994. 1994. Yeah, we branched off from the Iron County School District, and uh, and then through a bunch of different governance changes that happens, <laughs> we we bounced around. But the, yep. the school has been has been in operation since 1994. Beautiful, uh, beautiful school, beautiful facilities. Yeah, um, a lot of really wonderful programs. Um, and but, in the state system, they cannot award any kind of college credit. So they're clock hour based. Clock hour certificates. That's, that's right. So this project started out as, and there's a lot of ways to describe it, but the simplest way to describe it is, is how do we create a seamless pathway from SUU to Southwest Tech, from Southwest Tech to SUU, and, and find a way that all of the students at Southwest Tech working in these career programs can get college credit so that they can take those um, to SUU or take them to any other university and not just credit, but credit that transfers seamlessly in yeah. to a degree. Yep. So and I think that's the, is that a good mm-hmm. brief summary? Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, good um, job, President. And um, why don't we start talking about, um, well, this kind of began in a whole bunch of ways, but <laughs> I think it's helpful to point out that as we were early on in this, Steve, um, we went and met with our creditors. Yeah, actually, um, I think they were a little surprised by that. In subsequent conversations I've had with them, they they said universities don't usually come talk to us. We were uh, they, it's not they were taken aback, but they were impressed by the fact that uh, that we all flew up to Seattle to the uh, Northwest Commission for Colleges and Universities, and we said we are planning to do this thing that we think no one else has done nationally. And uh, we all around the table still think nobody has done it. Tessa's in the middle of doing her um, doctoral dissertation that has something to do with this. And as she's been doing searching, we, we, we still think this is a unique program in the United States. Our, in our visit to the Northwest Commission, um, I think, I think you know, Will, you were there, President, you and I were there. We, we went there with a little bit of trepidation because there's – there's a sense sometimes that accrediting bodies are there to keep you from doing something, right? And I think we all I think we all can agree that. Uh, and um, let's be honest, there's an arrogance from universities to non-degree granting technical colleges. Oh my so, gosh, yes. So we were worried about how she would respond. Yes, 
Absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, every conversation that we had with them both in person and then subsequently afterward was delightful and positive. And they, they not only said, um, we think you should do it, but they said, and when you do it, write articles about it and, and let's talk about it because this, this will be something that they, they could see this coming, I guess is what I'm saying that, that others would want to, to join in with this. And they, they were very interested from the very beginning. So, yeah, it's, an, it's such a creative, innovative program in terms of the scope of it that it all began with the creditors. And and we came the home. Process. Yeah, we came home almost immediately. And you and President Wood from Southwest Tech signed a memorandum of understanding, um, and uh, we had a little signing ceremony. And I think we all looked at each other and said, "Okay, so now what?" <laughs> yeah. That's right. I mean, we, That's right. And we've got this paper that tells us that we can. How how does this actually work? And uh, um, so we we put together a team on our side, and uh, and we'll put together a group from Southwest Tech, and and we began to meet uh, regularly on a number of different fronts. I think I saw Will almost as often as I saw my wife there for about six months. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, because because there are there are so many moving pieces, um, but I anyway I'm jumping ahead of myself. But but the the curricular part was the one I think we were all the most worried about. And, That's uh, right. Um, the president, you already made allusion to um, the the our, I think our greatest fear was that there would be um, that the group from the university would show up and say, ah, your your stuff is not as good as ours. Uh, and so we, we created a, a series of days, articulation days where That's we right. invited people to come and we'll, I should let you jump in here and, and talk about, so we, we hosted them actually at Southwest tech, very, um, very, we're, it was so wonderful to meet in your beautiful facilities and have beautiful catered lunches by, <laughs> by your folks and your culinary. By our culinary yeah. program. Anyway, Go ahead. Let's let's chat about it from your perspective. That that uh, curricular part. Yeah. So what we did was we we gathered faculty and administrators at, South, at Southwest Tech, and and we said, let's take a look at your curriculum. Let's pull together your syllabi. Let's pull together your what textbooks you're using. Let's get some examples of some of your assignments, some of your tests, both. Uh, both the the didactic tests, like handwritten tests, essays, essay questions, those kind of things, as well as uh, your hands-on uh, tests that you re- we required to do, and uh, we got all of that together. It was a monumental task. Just that and alone is is monumental with with twenty programs or so, and. Um, and then we invited the the counterparts at SUU uh, to come over the faculty from from SUU, and uh, and we shared with them this is what we do, and uh, we we fed them lunch, we talked to them. We uh, I say we, but but really President White, you and and your staff, your your provost and, and associate provost that um, gave them permission to review and and uh, look at what it is we're doing. And the, the advice we gave faculty members was um, primarily we're focused on competencies. If a student at a Southwest Tech uh, program is learning certain skills or certain knowledge, and that knowledge is also being learned at SUU, then those two courses ought to articulate one with another. In general, we try to keep a 30 clock hour to one credit hour ratio, but but it was more focused on those competencies. Those competencies were important. If they're learning and they're demonstrating that they understand and they they know um, and they can apply that and that is what they're learning at SUU, then, then we want that to to articulate. I think that was the first step in, in the process. And, and to uh, the everlasting credit of our faculty, there was no, uh, no sense of, uh, uh, superiority or anything. They came to the table with all of those same things. They came with their syllabi and everything else. And, 
and we just started to go down you know on one side of the table here's this on the other side here's that what are our common competencies and we broke out into small groups uh, by discipline and very quickly um what 11 or 12 of these things and and we need to we need to be clear about these these are these are not just program articulations these are course by course articulations so that that students who are taking a class at Southwest Tech would would automatically get credit for that class at Southern Utah University they didn't have to do anything they didn't have to pay a transfer fee they did nothing all they had to do was sign up you know participate in the uh, dual enrollment program and so so that those two elements the fact that it's a really deep course by course articulation and the fact that the student doesn't have to do anything to earn that credit aside from taking and passing the class at your institution mm-hmm. i think is what really makes this thing unique um, and and really ideal actually uh, for our two institutions because we we weren't getting a lot of your students right. and and our students couldn't come uh, your direction and you know take a course for credit over there and then bring it back into their bachelor's degrees so so students on both sides were being maybe less well served than they could have been and uh, uh, that that kind of drove all of our thinking from the very beginning faculty and administrators on both sides how can we how can we make this better for the students and uh, we often talk about that uh, on the show president but I, I i don't know that i've worked with a group of people that was more singular in focus um, than than the group that we got together in terms of look we know there are going to be problems but but we can overcome these problems for, in the best interest of students Tess, you um, uh, came in after the whole thing had been started and mm-hmm. then helping lead the program. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about what you're seeing. Gosh, it's been so fun to be a part of and to see how students are utilizing it. So, you know, my understanding is the original intent was to help Southwest Tech students have a pathway to the university if they decided they wanted to continue their education, right? So the course-by-course articulations. And I've certainly seen that. We're seeing that right now. Um, I know several students who are currently attending SUU who finished some of our programs last year. So that's really exciting to work with them. And then we're also seeing a lot of students from SUU who are supplementing their degrees by taking classes at Southwest Tech Um, We've had a couple of students just already since the program's been implemented who have graduated a semester before they expected because they were supplementing their full-time load at SUU with hands-on courses at Southwest Tech. Specifically, the ones I know of are are welding and computer science so far. Just yesterday, we had a student come in who's who's doing an agribusiness major, and he wants to take welding, and he's got electives he can use, so he'll probably fill those up with welding classes to help him finish his degree mm. as well. And so we're seeing a lot of SUU students utilize this partnership as well as the Southwest Tech students, you know, to further their, their education and to learn the things and gain the skills they want to for their future careers. Tess, you bring up um, a really important point about welding as an example. So... Southern Utah University has a variety of programs where welding would be helpful. Mm -hmm. But it makes no sense for Southern Utah University to build um, a welding shop and hire a welding faculty member and worry about all the aspects of that. When less than a mile away sits incredible welding faculty and facilities. And in fact, it costs less. Right. Well, you, yeah. your tuition is a lot less than ours. Yeah, pennies on yeah. the dollar. To go there. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So the so part of the goal here was is to find the best efficiencies that we can. Right. And in fact, f- find ways that the students at SUU can benefit from taking programs at Southwest Tech that apply to their majors, and help them be better prepared for their future careers. And we're seeing that as you're describing. We are. And and I know the academic advisors, I meet with them every semester so that they're aware, so they can advise their students, you know, about our programs. 
And I know some are coming from the advisors, but I think it's also word of mouth. They're just hearing about the partnership and, and looking into it and asking us questions or reaching out to me. And then they're like, yeah, this is amazing. I can't believe we can do this. <laughs> and we started this out by saying that the students need to choose. We're not going to just, you know, say you're at Southwest Texas, you're automatically getting credit. There needs to be some election on their part. Why don't we talk about the numbers, the overall successes? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I think Steve has those numbers, but... Um, I actually do. So um, this is as of the end of summer semester. We don't know about fall. And and I should say, as I'm reporting these numbers, that that one... So, so we have said, President, that in this year's worth of podcasts that we will... Uh, speak openly about challenges. And one of the challenges is that we have this dumb word called semester and that Southwest Tech doesn't use that word at all. They, they don't have that. And, uh, and so we, uh, at, at the, what would be the end of SUU's summer semester, um, which doesn't mean anything to Southwest Tech, but we've, we've had 905 students participate so far and we've granted uh, almost 3,200 credit hours to those students. So far, as we're aware, all of the qualified students, um, uh, all of the students in qualified programs that have been uh, in, uh, enrolling at Southwest Tech, when given the option to participate or not, 100% of them have participated in the dual enrollment program. And so, so these are, uh, we set ourselves lofty goals. We, we wanted um, a higher than 90% participation rate. We were hoping, I think, to have 500 students uh, in the first year, and we've um, we've had 100 percent participation in nearly a thousand students, and so it, it's it's going uh, kind of gangbusters over there, and we're we just couldn't be happier with it. I I'm not involved in it uh, in the day to day operation of this anymore, but but I you know I I consider the the time that we spent together. Uh, looking at all of this to be a, a really great education for me about the different ways um, that institutions do things. And, and I, the the thing that that always comes to my mind is uh, student services. So along with the articulation days, Will, that we were having with faculty, we began to hold regular meetings and and we invited the presidents of both institutions to be in the room because you and I both said it will be important. <laughs> it will be important to have both presidents there to say, no, no, we're, this is what we're doing. Let's, right. let's make it work. And, and uh, um, it, all of those things that, that, uh, uh, that make this thing unique, many of them presented great challenges. One is that, that credit hour to clock hour thing. One is how do you report student uh, completion? How, how do we set up a, a, a safe, uh, digitally secure uh, way when when we use Banner and you use a, a, a different program. Uh, what how do, how do we report? How do we report to iPads? How do you know all of these things that are just moving parts that, that that nobody in outside of higher ed would know about or care about, but in our world are are quite uh, important and and challenging, right? And so the, I, I, I actually loved those meetings too because, um, be, I mean, a great example is, is financial aid, right? Our financial aid is really different than yours. And, and I think when we first got together, we all kind of shrugged our shoulders and said, man, I don't know if we're going to be able to make that work. <laughs> and as it turned out, with some due diligence on both your part and our part, we figured out a solution that actually works great um, yeah, for I, all of our students. I think one of the keys was two naive presidents <laughs> well, who's, who sat in these meetings and said, oh, come on, it can't be that hard. <laughs> I'm well, confident you can figure this out. And, um, and then whenever there was a question about something, it was just, well, what's in the best interest of the students? And you guys figured it out. Yeah. And, um, and, and with that encouragement, I think everybody did. It did require some major paradigm shifting. It did. Tess, what are you hearing from the students? Mostly good stuff so far. Um, 
The SGU students who come all seem to have really positive feedback about their programs. They're really excited that they have an option, you know, to do hands-on type learning in addition to their academic learning at SGU. A lot of the Southwest Tech students who have moved on to SGU, they've been really, really grateful because they don't necessarily think they would have gone to SGU otherwise, you know, but they already had this, this easy pathway and these credits earned. And so, you know, that got them interested in coming to SGU where they wouldn't have otherwise or may not have otherwise, you know. So the student feedback, to me at least, has been really positive so far overall. The, it's, um, there's a philosophical issue here that I think is helpful to explain, and that is that Southwest Tech has some amazing things that higher ed doesn't have. Higher ed meaning colleges and universities. We're all higher ed. Um, the academic colleges and universities. Um, you can start, Will, you can start any Monday of the year, right? Yeah. And you move through as fast as you want to move through. And the tuition is really quite inexpensive. It's highly subsidized, much more highly subsidized than from the state. Mm-hmm. And, and the university... Um, starts three times a year, and in some programs six, if we're in the certain kind of things. But and we at the time we had two completely independent governing boards, and so we started out by saying we do not want to merge. We do not want to affect our governance. We want Southwest to keep everything great about it, and we want the university to keep everything great about it. We don't want to pretend that the university can deliver these courses. We don't want to make this so that we make money off of somebody. We want students at SUU who came to the university, not certain of their majors, and then they become confused, to feel like they can transfer or mostly change their major. That's kind of the way we wanted them to feel, that they're just changing their major. They're not dropping out, looking for something else. So it feels, we've tried to make it feel like one organization in two very different organizations. And when someone says, um, for example, um, in computer science, what happens if a student discovers that she can take this class at SUU or at Southwest, and Southwest charges very low tuition and the university charges higher. What do we do when someone discovers that? Because that's going to hurt the finances at the university. And our answer was, hooray for the student. Yeah. <laughs> she figured it out. <laughs> well, We're yeah. trying to train bright people. Yeah, and you know, and honestly, <laughs> we've seen it mostly during summer, though not during the regular semester. But what they're doing in computer science is they're saying, oh, these are open entry, self-paced. If I already understand programming, I can knock these classes out quickly. And then my prerequisites are done so I can actually be at a higher level when I return to SU in, in the fall. That's what I've been seeing with them is they're taking advantage of it during the summer to get ahead. For the fall with their prerequisites. That is a beautiful success story. Yeah, more than one. I've had several that I know of, you know. We had, at, at some point, um, Chris Cox was the governor's budget director. And she called me and said, um, how are you going to measure success? I says, well, Chris, um, let's see. If this program is completely successful, that means that some of our students will take classes at Southwest Tech, which means that our revenue might dip just a teeny bit, and it might mean that our enrollments dip just a little bit. And if a student comes to SUU and then has second thoughts about her or his career path, that student might change her major, so to speak, and go to Southwest Tech. So let me see. I think that most of the outcomes are negative for us (laughs) in terms of reporting. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you're you're never going to be able to assess the success of this program if you look at the two schools totally independent of each other. You're going to have to look at them uh, jointly. And it's going to have to force us 
this is, I think, is a good example of where assessment is really, really, really hard, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to just look at almost anecdotal evidence of all the students' experiences to say it's working um, for this person, and it's working for this person, That's and right. this person, and this person. And the university doesn't have to hire a welding instructor for their various programs, but what are you hearing from your faculty, Will? I, our faculty love it. Um, I think they're they're more connected with their counterparts at SUU than they have been in the past. Um, I know our our welding teachers are having the engineering faculty over frequently. We bring the wel- we bring uh, the the engineering students over, and we have a a night of welding. We we suit them up and put them in booths and. Have them strike an arc on, on some <laughs> some metal and make some metal hot, and uh, and they love it because they don't necessarily get to do that in their engineering program. But it's important for them to know what happens when that rod hits that metal, and um, uh, and so they they see that the we've had some of the the engineering faculty who have come over and actually taken a class um, because they have an engineering degree, an advanced degree in engineering, but may not have any industry level experience. And so this provides them some some hands-on experience that they like. We have the same situation in computer science. We have um, culinary students. We have um, uh, automotive students that, that are just, uh, and faculty who are connecting with each other um, like they haven't had before. And I, I think that that's a, a benefit for them because they're all faculty and they, they all have similar experiences. And now that they can, they can collaborate, not only just on curriculum, but also on some experiences that I think is helpful for um, as they go back to their, their individual institutions and, and talk to their students, they now have a broader perspective of, of education and, and their industry. There's, um, um, I'm just thinking about how much time it would take us to talk about this program. I mean, it could go on for a week. Yeah, we, we could do a series of podcasts for sure. Um, about it. I, I'd like to mention something else, and then let's jump um, to another topic here. But we, we also made this decision, didn't we, that we wanted to make sure that the program lasted a long time. And, and didn't change when the personalities uh, changed. And so one of the tactics that we used among many was, why don't the two institutions give each other's institution the same benefits as if they were employees? And so if you're a SUU employee, then that means that you can get a discount on your tuition yep. free your dependents discount. And um, and there's a variety of those kind of benefits. And also at Southwest Tech, and so we said, let's, let's really act as if we're different departments of the same school, even though we are not the same school. And so we extended all those benefits to each other. And there were moments when we thought, could this totally overwhelm Southwest? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, and I'd love to get your reaction to that. But the, but the point was, is that if we can get the employees invested and the employees' students taking advantage of, the employees' uh, children taking advantage of the different programs, that, that we could create a culture where no one would want this to go away. Right. <laughs> right. It's not that there's a benefit to the employees. It's that the employees now have a personal invested interest to make sure that this is a success. Because there is actually something in it for them. I'm a political science professor, and um, the greatest good from a political science standpoint comes when the personal interest aligns with the public interest. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Anyway, how's that worked, Will and Tessa, in terms of the, what you see? In... You go first. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> I think it's been it's been great. I know that we hear it a lot in in our school where we have uh, employees who um, have children. I personally have two children who are 
uh, going to school at SUU this this semester this year under an employee uh, benefit under an employee benefit they get half tuition <laughs> at SUU because I'm an employee at Southwest Tech <laughs> and so um, so that's it's been hugely beneficial and um, that way and it I think it draws allegiance to SUU I think. Uh, I think we all have an allegiance to our school that we work for. We, we wear apparel that, that matches that. It's not uncommon to walk the halls of Southwest Tech and see Southwest Tech employees wearing SUU apparel. Um, and, and at times you're like, well, hold on a second. Here it is. <laughs> no, wait, we're okay. We're okay with that one, right? I mean, we would. But um, And so that's that's important, I think. And, and, um, and our employees, uh, I think, Part of that, I think you alluded to, uh, perhaps we might have felt a little overwhelmed. You know, we have about 45 full-time employees at Southwest Tech. And, and we have about 1,000. <laughs> that's right. So when we start talking about extending benefits, yes, our <laughs> tuition's much smaller and lower, but to extend that to 1,000 people and their and their dependents <laughs> right. versus oh, 45 now you're people. <laughs> real money. <laughs> and so, uh, so it felt like it had the potential to be overwhelming. But um, even though we, we see a lot of crossover with employees and employee dependents, I don't know that it's been overwhelming. Uh, it's actually been really good. It's been, it's been good to talk to students. They say, well, my dad or my mom is a professor over at SUU, and this is what they teach. And it allows us uh, an opportunity to connect with uh, additional faculty members a different, and uh, additional staff members at SUU. This, is, this mm-hmm. has always been one of the difficult challenges between organizations so different is that the cultures are so different. Right. I mean, there's mm-hmm. almost nothing about the cultures that's mm-hmm. the same. And there were moments when both presidents had to kind of swallow hard, right? I mean, you, you, <laughs> you just said, yeah, we're going to uh, probably lose some money on tuition and um, we might lose people in our iPads report. And we might, you know, they're all of the things that in our typical reporting Thing that might actually look as though they've been negatively impacted, which I know, uh, you know, I I worked long enough with you, President, to know that 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 it, that's one of those moments when a president has to say, swallow hard, this is what's in the best interest of the students, and if it if it doesn't help us in our reporting, oh well, um, we if if students figure out that they can take a class at a better time at a lower rate at our sister institution with which with you know with whom we have this thing then good on them and and we're fine to forego that tuition um president wood had to swallow hard on the tuition benefit thing <laughs> I, I was in that meeting and <laughs> watched that moment <laughs> transpire when he finally started to realize the scope of what that was going to be but to his credit as to yours um both of you as we worked through this even though there's been a few moments of pause, nothing has has deviated from that. Is this in the best interest of students? And in our particular case, this thing we're talking about, this tactic of, of shared benefits, it this is in the best interest of the health of the partnership. And mm-hmm. um, I can just say anecdot- anecdotally, I've said this many times uh, before, but uh, when I get questions about this particular project, it's inevitably. Um, now, I have a son or daughter that really <laughs> wants to take uh, a, you know, they, I'd, I'd love that they're going to go here to SUU, but they, they really are interested in HVAC or they're really interested in welding or they're really interested in something that, that Southwest Tech does. Um, tell me more about that tuition benefit. And so, <laughs> so there, in it, that's if, if there was a brilliant, uh, stroke of uh, inspiration for that program president that that stroke of inspiration that you had to to help us pursue that i think was was the moment at which we all realized how how serious and how deep this partnership could run and and uh, again to everyone's credit yeah uh, it's it's been very effective and I think as a result of that, of, of yours and President Wood's leadership and desire to make it work and build those those deep, meaningful relationships between the faculty and staff at both institutions. So we've got the official benefits, but we've also found other ways to build relationships and collaborate that are not necessarily officially a part of the agreement. 
for example, our community education courses, right? Our, yeah. They were yeah. duplicating efforts to market and they said, well, let's work together on this, you Print, know? Printing separate schedules yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, and... so now they've got a joint website. They send out a joint schedule to the community and it's been a great collaboration for them. You know, our culinary program, we catered one of your tailgates last year, which was a lot of fun for us to get out to football, you know, for our faculty and staff. It was amazing. And it was a way to showcase culinary, but also feed the people that come to that, you know, some really good food. Um, Things like Title IX. Um, I'm also the Title IX coordinator at Southwest Tech, but I've been able to collaborate with your Title IX coordinator. And we've been able to do joint trainings to meet new federal requirements so that we didn't have to figure them out just on our own. And so all of these unofficial collaborations that have been really positive for both schools have been really, really neat to see. And I think they're a direct result of the support that, that you and President Wood have, have given this partnership. And so it's been, it's been really amazing to see those kind of naturally come into play as people have said, yeah, how can we work together for both of our benefits? Yeah, and if we, if we have a... Um an SUU employee day at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. We try to always remember to invite the Southwest Tech employees. Yeah, and we appreciate it a lot. And, and you get tickets <laughs> to sporting events and yep. and uh, fine yeah. arts events and things. Yep. At our at our signing agreement, we presented President Wood with a football helmet and said, you're the only technical college in Utah that has a football team now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. yeah. no, that's... I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah but, um, let's kind of shift into some of the challenges. Um and um, what what I remember is is when we launched this agreement, the the enthusiasm from the system of technical colleges exceeded the enthusiasm from the system of higher education colleges and universities. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pausing because I'm thinking, anyway. what's the best thing? Do you want to <laughs> delve further into that? Present? No, I just think, it's, I just think um, um, that was one of the interesting uh, challenges for it was that I think that uh, President Wood and all of those that worked with him were a little bit more enthusiastic than the people, enthusiastic than the people that worked with me. Um, but interestingly enough, um, to fast forward from then till now, the state has changed the governance structure, and the um, the my immediate boss is the same as President Wood's immediate boss. That's right. Yeah. So it's still two systems, but it's really under one governing board, and that's been beautiful. Actually, it's really neat. Well, okay, Tess and Will, what could have gone better? I can say what still could, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Or I, wasn't, the I wasn't there at the start, but... And a lot of these we're, we're working through as they come up. Um, there are some programs still that the course-by-course articulations could be improved because the articulations currently don't really fit into a degree plan. So although there, our students are earning credits in those programs, they're not necessarily degree related so they don't necessarily help them so they get electives but it doesn't apply yeah. to the requirements for the right degree. and depending on the degree there might not be a lot of electives that they need or right. these electives that they're getting from us are lower division and they might need all upper division in their electives you know it just depends on the degree but for some students they'll have these credits that don't necessarily benefit them as they seek to earn a, a bachelor's you know necessarily so that's something that that continues to be worked on and I think will continue to improve as as time goes on and as people come together. If we look at the if we look at them program by program, um, the majority of the programs have beautiful articulation mm-hmm. and a few of them don't. Correct. What's the difference? What why are some better than others? That's a challenging question, President. <laughs> <laughs> um I think sometimes there's a need or a desire to protect what's yours. There's some historical traditions that we um, we try to hold on to, and uh, uh, you know, there's an idea that well, you're a tech college and 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 you're pre-baccalaureate and you really should be doing things that are at the one or two thousand level 
course level area. And, and yet the competencies in this course are the same competencies we have in a 3,000 level course or a 4,000 level course. And, and, and when you say one and two and three and 4,000, we're talking about basically yeah, like a freshman, fresh, sophomore, yeah, or junior, senior. Like right? a freshman, sophomore kind level of. versus a junior, senior level, an upper division level. And, um, and we really shouldn't give you 3,000 level credit. We shouldn't give you junior level credit for work that's being conducted at a, at a technical college that, that primarily serves freshman level, sophomore level college students. And, um, and, and so working through, through that, helping people understand, I, I think what happens is, you're right, you spoke to it, there's the great majority of our programs and the great majority of, of the colleges at, at SUU, departments at SUU are articulating well. And the ones who are not, it's fairly obvious who is and who is not um, articulating well. And, um, and I know that there was uh, at least one department who uh, at, a, at, a, at a meeting to approve some articulation agreements, we learned at that meeting yeah. that that was not going to be approved. <laughs> kind of yeah. almost surprisingly, I think Tessa was there, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Steve yeah. was there. And, and um, But since that point, faculty from that department has come over to our school. They're taking advantage of, of our students. Our faculty members are enrolled in classes in that department. Their faculty are enrolled in classes at our school. And, uh, and I think that, that that relationship is getting better. There are still some that still need some work, and we'll continue to work with them. Um, you know, when, when a faculty member is ready to, to make that commitment to the articulation, we're, we're, we'll stand ready to help them move that along. And, and uh, I, I, I'd hate to force it. I hate to feel, mm-hmm. have a, a university faculty member or a dean or a department chair feel like they've been, their hand was forced in this. But I think they see that they're kind of the outliers. Uh, outlier. They're the odd men out, yeah. Well, Steve, in terms of these articulation meetings, what's the difference between the ones that were articulated very well and the ones that were not quite as well? Um, I, you know, I think Will alluded to the, the difference between upper division and lower division. It was interesting uh, from my perspective, Will, to see that on our side, a couple of our um, academic programs actually revised downward. That's right. Their <laughs> their thing. They the courses they they were teaching at the three and four thousand level that Southwest Tech was teaching at their level, and they had identical competencies. And they said we shouldn't be awarding upper division credit for this if Southwest Tech is teaching. So they they actually revised uh, downward. Um, but I, I think the difference, though, President, from from my perspective anyway. Was um, was some of that that lingering sense that that um, the university should drive all of this, and that that uh, Southwest Tech was fortunate to be participating, sort of a thing, and and maybe not even having the right people around the table initially from a couple of the academic programs, um, and and again we uh, we were very clear from v- both presidents on down that we wanted this to be a voluntary participation uh, thing. It continues to be voluntary for our academic programs. And from the very beginning, uh, and I think this is true in almost every human endeavor, from the very beginning, some people got it immediately. They saw the depth that could be achieved. Others kind of went into it a little bit half-heartedly. And as Will said, that that half-heartedness is now becoming wholeheartedness in some places, and but there still remains uh, there still remains work there to be done in a couple of areas. And uh, I have every reason to believe that um, that the academic folks on our side and the academic folks on Southwest Tech side will actually make those things come to pass. And and there were some things that we almost created out of whole cloth. Um, my favorite thing about this is that we had to create a new prefix at SUU for our swine herd management thing. Uh, And and it's the P-O-R-K prefix. That's my favorite academic prefix ever, the pork (laughs) prefix. Um, And and so some of the things that, that, you know, when we talk about stumbling blocks, um, 
it, some of them were not really stumbling blocks. That it's just new ground that we're plowing, and no one's ever done it before. So we we honestly don't know if, in some cases, are we being successful? One one of the ways that you would that you would monitor success is by comparing yourselves to similar programs, and there's really nothing similar. And so uh, as we you know as we continue to be the <laughs> the forerunners, maybe the only runners in this. Um, We'll continue continue to look inward at what we're doing and try to try to improve uh, both our processes and the outcomes. But but that's for me that's one of the challenges. Is that I mean I've I know Tess is writing this dissertation. I've gotten to write a couple of uh, magazine articles. I know President Wood has uh, gone on a little bit of a speaking junket and other things talking about this. And it's it's the newness and uniqueness of it that is both an amazing positive but also leaves us wondering is there more that we could be doing and as we look around no one else is doing it so it it kind of falls on our shoulders to continue to innovate with this which in some ways is a little bit of a challenge if you're creating all the new ideas because no one else is doing it so this is one of the um and when we keep saying we're the only program in the country there's a lot of um organizations that have pieces of this. Sure, transfer agreements mm-hmm. and other things. Yeah, what, what we're talking about being the unique um, program in the country is a fully comprehensive, completely accredited uh, program between both. And we refer to it as a dual enrollment, but probably technically it's a transfer program. Yeah, it, it, it's as close it's, as you can get to dual enrollment. I mean, it's not simultaneous. It lags by about two weeks. But that's faster than anywhere in the world. And students mm-hmm. don't have to apply they don't to have do to it. Apply, they don't have to pay yeah. a dime. Mm-hmm. And so that that's where it really makes a difference, yeah. I think. Their Southwest Tech ID cards have SUT numbers on them. I mean, they are. Yeah. Yeah. They're students at both. They're students at both. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we count them for iPads purposes as being at one place or the other for the right. classes they take. So we're not getting double counting. So that's one of the challenges or issues that's still being worked through is that some departments are perfectly articulated and some um, a little bit less perfectly. And probably the more engaged the faculty are in the two departments, probably the higher the articulation is because you've developed that trust and confidence and, and, uh, and you have the decision makers more engaged. Um, another issue moving forward is is that um, I think that at SUU, one of our goals is is that we not duplicate anything. So we live in a community of 30,000-ish people, and we've got these two, uh, one university and one technical college. And hopefully at some point, we will not be offering the same thing at two schools ever. So if you are offering a class, Will, at the tech, then SUU would not have, offer that same course. And we still have some duplication, but it's not a lot. And you can't just turn things on and off. But right. as we move forward, the, the hope is is that we don't have anything that's duplicative. And if there are things that, that Southwest Tech does better or more efficiently than we do, we want to be the people that get rid of that thing, right? I mean, that yeah. it, it, it this has to be a two-way street. There will, in the same way that, that both institutions have been willing to sacrifice to do that, I, I think moving forward into phase two of this, um, there will be more common, more common sacrifices, more more things that we look at and say, you know what, they teach uh, they teach beginning level math better than we do. As just an example, that the the O ninety nine kind of math classes, um, maybe we should just start to ramp that down over here yeah. and just send our students to Southwest Tech. That yeah. those those kinds of things will the that's that's phase two I think of the of the project. Yeah, and it's and if if it's less expensive for the students and less expensive for the taxpayers, then that's what we should be doing, and it allows us to reinvest resources. But those those are difficult things because we have people teaching in those areas. That's right. Um, well, that's another issue. Um, one, another one that I've thought, um, well, when this happens, then it'll be a massive success in my mind. <laughs> and that is that in certain degrees, 
at SUU, you can't complete the degree without taking a class from Southwest Tech. And um, this that, is also part of phase two. Yeah. Yeah. That will show that we really are integrated. Yep. And it will show that we really are maximizing our resources for the student's benefit. And because we have some entrepreneurial students that we have already mentioned that are going over there and doing that. They're, they're seeing, okay, I can, I can get this done at Southwest Tech. I can bring it back because it automatically transfers back uh, and it will count toward my degree program. Um, but but actually, actually changing our curriculum to include Southwest Tech classes, that's, that's going to be the next big step on the university's part, for sure. Yeah. And we've... Um Tess, we just had last last uh, spring our first SUU graduate who, as part of her degree program, had a Southwest Tech class. That's mm-hmm. uh, a theater technology bachelor's degree student who had a welding class from Southwest Tech. And, you know, if your job is to make sets and all these kinds of things, that, that makes so much sense. Yep. So hypothetically, and, and she took that... Um, it was a super exciting moment mm-hmm. for all of us, I think. Yeah. But it'll be a it'll be a triple exciting moment when we say, in order to graduate with hypothetically with uh, theater technology, you have to take this welding class because you're going to need it to build sets. That's when we really say we trust you. <laughs> <laughs> and I use that hypothetically because that may or may not be the program. But anyway. What else is there? Anything else that's the next grouping? One of the other challenges that I think is important for people to know about is is information sharing and the technology to do so because it's got to be, you know, you've got to be sharing data between the two schools if they're if your students are duly enrolled and sharing their, you know, their course records and things like that. And you've got to do it securely. And the way that we shared the records initially, we found out in the registrar's office at SUU, they were spending a good chunk of their week, the person in charge of, of actually recording those classes, just like half of his week was spent just filtering through the records we were sending because we weren't doing it in a way that was easy for, for him to get out the new data. Um, and also during COVID, as he was working from home, our records, the secure records weren't making it through the VPN and he was also making updates that weren't making it back to us through the VPN. And so these are just really interesting challenges that until you start communicating and saying, hey, we're not seeing these certain things, or he's saying, hey, this is taking me forever. Is there a better way to do this? Um, those were those were big challenges and sometimes continue to be so. Just last week, we talked about some issues with with data transfer and information that wasn't coming through to figure those out. But that's something that I think because of the security and 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 things that you need to have with that, that, that people should be aware of that it might take some time to work through, you know, the record sharing and things like that. Ultimately, uh, the ideal world, we would be on some of the same computer systems. And that would add to the efficiencies between the two schools if we had a common one. And then we could have employees that are managing the same systems for both schools. So there may be, in the long run, some staffing side efficiencies that we haven't um, explored yet that would allow us to move resources to teaching. The more efficient we are on the staff side, the more resources we have left for teaching. Anything else, Will? You know, I think we've hit practically everything that we've, we've done. It's, it's been a great, uh, exciting partnership i look forward to what that looks like in the future i think it's going to be it's going to be great i um it's interesting as i go and meet with the other instructional officers at the tech colleges and that's how that uh we had a conversation earlier this week or last week with uh, another tech college and and that's how that gets out it's well how are you doing this like I think we understand philosophically how that works, but how are you really doing <laughs> doing yeah. this? And uh, you know, is it really working, or is this just a uh, a press ploy that that you're doing? And it's, no, that's really working. We have 900 students who are receiving credit while they're attending Southwest Tech, and and then you get 
then you get, well, you need to come here and help us understand <laughs> how and why. And let's bring, let's bring our local university together. And um, there's just a lot, there's a lot that goes into it and it's not easy. And, and though we might've, uh, you know, carved a path forward, uh, I don't know that it's that much easier for those that are coming behind us. That, that path still is difficult. It's, uh, there, there isn't really, my impression is there isn't really a system that you can put in place that makes this work. It just requires an absolute commitment of the leadership of both places. And, and everybody has to give something away. That's right. I've, I've had other university presidents tell me, well, we're not going to do that because we have to give something away and we have to give more away than the other school gives away. And so it's not a fair partnership. And, um, and who cares? And who cares? Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's right. This uh, is, ultimately, it's are we running these things for ourselves or for the students? Well, and Steve, I don't know if if we were to add up um, um, how much the university may or may not have given up to make this partnership work, whatever that amount is that we've never sat down and tried to think through. I'm sure that we have far more gained in goodwill. Yep. And in the satisfaction of knowing that the students are the ones that are ultimately benefiting. But the legislature, uh, the governor's office, our boards, they're grateful. And I think that's um, accrued to our benefit. Yep. What's your last words, Tessa? I guess just that, I mean, this partnership's only really been in action for a year. And it's done incredible things so far. So I can't wait to see what it will continue to do for students in the future. It's exciting. We'll be back in this show in a couple years to say, well, okay, now where are we at? That's right. And hopefully by then we will have discovered a whole bunch of new challenges <laughs> <laughs> that can keep us busy. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. We've had as our guests today, Tessa Douglas and Will Pierce from Southwest Technical College, uh, who we are very proud to count as partners in our dual enrollment project. And uh, we love working with the folks at STEC. And uh, uh, thank you for uh, coming to visit with us today. This is a very fun thing to talk about. And thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. We'll be back again with another podcast soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.